Hey, I'm Miroise Dumontay. I'm a researcher and lecturer at Birkbeck in the Department of Psychological Sciences. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, educational neuroscience. So what is educational neuroscience? If you want to learn more about it, one way is to uh, read this new book um, by Denis Marichal, Brian Butterworth and Angie Tolmy, who are researcher in the Bloomsbury, so at Birkbeck, UCL and the uh, Institute of Education. And this is kind of, uh, kind of opening this new field um, of educational neuroscience. Educational neuroscience combines three disciplines that are um, education, psychology and neuroscience. And the idea behind educational neuroscience is um, a vision to bring together these, two, these three previously distinct disciplines um, to try to focus on a common problem, which is um, how to promote better learning. And this will mean building a new scientific community um, and a new, this new discipline of educational neuroscience. So why, why do we want to do this? Um, well, a better understanding of how learning is organized and is occurring in the brain um, will help us kind of um, understand more about education. And at the moment, very little research so far um, in neuroscience and in psychology has had an impact on um, education. So what is lacking, what we think is lacking, is a body of researchers that are able to um, coordinate kind of strength between these three disciplines of education, um, psychology and neuroscience. So how are we going to do this? Um, the idea is to um, build on existing research collaborations that are um, already um, been found between educationists and psychologists or psychologists and neuroscientists. Um, and to try also to create a new initial um, postgraduate research, postgraduate training and continual professional development opportunities for, for example, teachers um, for becoming experts in educational neuroscience. What would be the impact of this new field of educational neuroscience? Um, the idea is like bringing education, psychology and neuroscience together um, can help designing better learning environments um, through the lifespan. So not focusing just on children, but also in adults. For example, here at Birkbeck, we're focusing quite a lot on um, um, adult education. Um, and the idea is that this will lead to more um, fulfilled and more effective uh, learners. So I'm uh, lucky to be part of the Centre for Educational Neuroscience, so the CEN, um, which has been created maybe five, six years ago now as a kind of virtual research centre um, combining strengths from uh, University College London, the Institute of Education and Birkbeck, which are all kind of centrally located um, in London and which are already collaborating um, on sort of various research projects. So you might have heard of kind of um, educational neuroscience or brain training um, and in fact there's quite a lot of programs uh, online, a website about kind of learning and they mention brain training or brain based learning or learning styles and brain preferences. So there's all these different things that are out there where people say their, um, their training program, their learning program is based on evidence from neuroscience but really that's kind of going beyond what has been shown. And um, because of that, um, there's quite a lot of neuro myths that are kind of been found in the education literature. Um, and so in the last decade, there's been kind of a step change to try to bring uh, cognitive neuroscience and education uh, together in a dialogue. Um, and one of the reasons maybe where there's more of this effort, effort going on is that there's some anxiety from the researchers over the kind of parallel world of pseudo neuroscience that's been found um, in schools. And many of these concepts that are found and talked about in school are unscientific and educationally unhelpful. And it's clearly kind of a need for myth busting. However, there's currently no um, forum to scrutinize and clearly communicate messages combining scientific and educational understanding to teachers. And that's the aim of that new field of educational neuroscience. And that's the aim of kind of training, pos um, starting postgraduate training and continuous development in educational neuroscience to make, uh, to create this forum and people who are kind of more familiar with these different um, disciplines. So recently, a couple of years back, um, the Royal Society, Society uh, asked a group of researchers to um, think um, and about neuroscience and the implications for education and learning. And what they suggested is that um, the conclusion was that education is about enhancing learning, 
and neuroscience is about understanding the mental processes involved in learning. And it's common ground, um, so with this focus on learning, as I was saying before, um, suggests a feature in which educational practice can be transformed uh, by science, just as medical practice was transformed by science um, about a century ago. So they suggest this analogy with um, medicine um, and the fact that medicine was uh, transformed by uh, biological sciences. And they suggest we could try apply the similar model um, and use cognitive neuroscience and psychology to try and transform uh, and inform um, education. So what will happen uh, with this new field of educational neuroscience? Well, it's not clear yet, it's, it's still, still kind of developing, but the idea is that the um, initial contribution of neuroscience will be to try to understand why the educational methods that do work, why do they work? Uh, and only later might we be able to suggest to try something else that might work better on the basis of, of, of our studies. A second point is that, again, continuing this analogy with uh, medicine, um, there might be only few um, magic bullet insight, like you know, the similar way of vaccination or penicillin completely changed um, aspect of medicine. Instead, it might be more an accumulation of small improvements that eventually add up to a revolution. Um, so there's this idea that it's kind of multiple small effects um, that will gradually have a big effect. So for example, um, things that you might hear about if you go on this course or if you think about educational neuroscience and you read about it will be about working memory training, kind of educational video games, space learning, executive function training, reward-based learning, whether sleep might be helpful to consolidate memories, the diet and exercise, meditation, social networking, all these things might have effect on education um, and we might all contribute small effects, but all combined together might change the way people are learning. So another uh, idea from educational neuroscience, what will happen first um, is that the, the initial findings might not be, um, that will have an influence, might not be topic specific, they might actually be quite broad um, findings. For example, there might be factors we discover about um, brain plasticity, the role of diet and exercises, as I was just mentioning, the role of sleep, like how important sleep might be for uh, the way you're learning, what time it would be best to you know, learn something just before going to bed or not, or after a nap. Uh, the role of hormones, emotions, um, vigilance and stress, even like social um, hierarchy effects, even like in schools with bullying and things like that. Um, it might be kind of also things that are general across species that we might discover how the brain is learning new information and we might discover that from studies in um, other animals like rats and black rat models. Um, and uh, whether it's kind of, you know, primates and rats, it might be not directly relevant for education, but actually the way if we learn more about how the brain is learning itself, um, then it will help and have implication for um, humans. Another aspect um, that we're thinking about is that uh, the main practical consequence of neuroscience on education will be on the training of future teachers. Um, and so that's kind of another idea for this continuing kind of process of development, if we can um, help um, teachers kind of go on some courses, short courses, to try to get um, the message across between education, uh, psychology and neuroscience. Um, and in a way that to try to encourage um, teachers to think about um, how they can establish what works in a classroom, how they can become researchers themselves and try different things and assess what might be going on. But something to take into account is that um, uh, education is intrinsically uh, something quite complex, a social classroom-based phenomenon. And so that might have implication in terms of the, like if we have interventions, the variability between schools, between the pupils, between the teachers, um, the overall context, and all that makes it quite a kind of complex problem, but it's still worth um, tackling. And finally, um, a remaining issue reminds, uh, re uh, Finally, another issue is about um, ethical uh, issues surrounding um, interventions. And you can think about, um, you know, ethical issues about drug testing, for example, that have been in the news a couple of years back. Um, but here is like, if you're thinking about doing something in education, um, is there, are there any implication of who can you do it with or can't do it with? Whose authorization do you have to kind of do this type of research or this type of intervention? 
And for example, drugs um, treat directly some disease that a kind of a unique person and individual might have, while education is kind of much more general and it can be considered as a pathway out of poverty in some cases. And so, you know, how do you implement this? How do you implement changes? And that's kind of very broad ranging um, issues that needs to be um, considered. So what have we found? What are the emerging findings in educational neuroscience? What do we teach on this kind of courses on educational neuroscience? So again, it's still the early beginning, but um, for example, one th type of uh, research that's been done is about individual differences. So try to identify um, differences in learning in children. So for example, um, it's been found that dyslexic readers can be identified through abnormal neural structures. Uh, so, for example, one of the studies looking into this um, found that at six months old, um, babies showed differences in the neural activity recorded on their scalp um, when they were um, listening to speech sound. And they also found differences in the way they were head turning, like turning in response to um, speech sound. A second example that I was involved myself um, in a study um, that I'm going on in Sweden um, that we found that brain activation during a visual spatial working memory task which involves like looking at dots on the screen that coming up one by one in a sequence and then you have to remember that sequence for a uh, kind of a few seconds so that's called working memory and it's visual spatial because it's things presented on the screen and it's not kind of numbers or letters you're remembering and what we found is that brain activity when you're doing this task this type of tasks as measured with a, um, a magnetic resonance imaging scanner, so an MRI scanner, um, shows that um, was predicting uh, arithmetic performance, so math performance on kind of simple math test two years later. So the activity in your brain when you're doing this kind of remembering visual spatial information could predict how well you were performing on um, tasks two years later. And some people might say, well, what do we really need this kind of brain imaging methods? Um, because you can predict this similarly just from the performance on the work, these type of working memory tests. And what we found is that there was more um, kind of power to explain the individual differences when you were using the brain data than just the behavioral data. So the idea is that you go, if you go closer to the kind of the neural substrate of all this processing, then you might be more sensitive to individual differences. Um, a third quite similar example is that um, people found that, again, differences in brain structure and differences in brain activity before some children um, were undergoing some um, tutoring uh, predicted how well they would improve uh, on the basis of that um, tutoring for a few weeks. So their starting point, like their brain starting point, could predict how well they would improve um, from the learning. And uh, to continue um, uh, talking about individual, individual differences in training and learning, um, it's also been found that differences in terms of your genetics, um, so if you have different uh, variants of a particular gene, in this case it's a gene that's um, coding for a dopamine receptor, so it's a, a neurotransmitter in your brain that trans um, that's used to transfer information between your brain cells, so between your neurons. Um, if you have individual differences in how this particular uh, receptor works, um, it can predict how well you will benefit from a training, a working memory training. So from trying to train how many things you can remember for a short time, um, that's been shown that depending on your genes, you might benefit more for that particular type of training um, than um, like another person. So, and this again, you know, it's not education per se, it's not psychology per se, because we need this kind of genetic, biological information that's more related to the kind of the field of neuroscience. Okay, so I was talking about these um, emerging findings in educational neuroscience, talking about the identification of individual differences based on like brain structure, brain function, so from the electrical activity we measure on the scalp, or from activity we measure deeper in the brain. Uh, and the genetic differences. Another aspect that educational neuroscience has been looking at, and I kind of mentioned, alluded to it already, is training. Uh, so for example, it's been found um, that if you um, use trans uh, transcranial direct current stimulation, which is a method where you put two electrodes on the brain, um, and you induce a current between these two electrodes that goes through the brain, 
It's been found that if you stimulate the brain in this way, in some brain regions, um, you can learn, like in the particular on the right side rather than on the left side, um, it improves the acquisition of a kind of a new arbitrary number system um, that you're learning. They found that in adults, it hasn't been done in children yet, partly because of ethical issues. Um, but it's been found that so if you stimulate the brain in this way electrically, you can improve the way people are learning about numbers. And finally, a third um, kind of third aspect that people have been interested in the field of educational neuroscience is the use of technologies. So quite often you hear about people saying, "Oh, adolescents now they're all on their computers or their mobile phone." You know, is that affecting how their brain is developing? And we don't know yet, and it's part, probably going to be now part of our culture, and we can't kind of totally ignore it. That is part of what we're learning. We're learning how to use computer. We're learning how to use, you know, extract information from um, the internet, etc. Um, but one question is like whether you can, we can use technologies to improve learning and to facilitate the learning process. And so for just one example is that um, research by uh, Bavillian colleagues uh, has been found that visual spatial uh, attention and equity, so how much you can pick up differences, like small differences in what you're seeing, can be trained by playing certain types of video games. Um, interestingly, it's not the type of video games you think would train your attention and your kind of spatial skills. It's not Tetris, where you're trying to arrange these kind of cubes, but it's typically the first-person shooter game. So when you have like a really motiv like strong motivation, and it's, and it's thought that this kind of arousal motivation um, might be making your brain more plastic, and that's why you're finding uh, we're finding effects. Um, so in fact, video games are just kind of um, I was saying very engaging and so neuroimaging has revealed that they stimulate our brain reward system um, as much as um, methylphenidate, Ritalin, which is what's given to children with ADHD, um, and some amphetamines. Um, so there's really a strong effect that's been observed in the brain. <clears throat> And um, this response has been found as uh, it's not just related to attention, so how much you're going to focus on something because it's really rewarding, but in fact it's been, it seems that it's also changing the um, synapto, synaptic plasticity, so the plasticity of your brain, so how your brain is going to encode and learn new things. And that's why it's like, how can we try to use this plasticity induced by these exciting video games? Can we use that for education? And that's kind of whole field um, kind of um, open for discovery. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, if you want to um, learn more about educational neuroscience and be involved in this quite new field, um, one thing you can do is apply for the MSc in Educational Neuroscience uh, at Birkbeck. Um, this MSc is shared between the Institute of Education um, and Birkbeck, and that means you have um, the strengths from both um, institutions, and you can do research projects also in both institutions. And the idea is to try to really think about these issues um, of educational neuroscience and how we can make the field um, go forward. And just to give you an example, at Birkbeck, the type of research project you could do, um, three quite um, major kind of research groups that are um, at Birkbeck. One is the Institute for the Study of Children, Families and Social Issues. And there, what happens in this kind of grouping is that they um, research um, the development, functioning, and well-being of children and families, and to try to address social issues. There's a center for brain and cognitive development that's called the Baby Lab, and here they study how babies learn and develop, particularly in the first two years of life, and particularly trying to predict and know more about um, when children are going to develop um, autism or ADHD, whether there's any way we can figure that out from the first two years of life. And I'm, for example, particularly um, uh, involved in Buckney, which is the Birkbeck and UCL Center for Neuroimaging, so where we have a magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And here we um, use this scanner to try to investigate quite a broad range of fields, um, of domains, so the development of um, language and social cognition, cognitive control, and also adult um, functioning. And just to conclude, that's kind of was three big ones, but there's also loads of other um, sort of labs where you could be involved and in doing research in at Birkbeck, whether it's kind of effective in cognitive neuroscience, about language, brain and behavior, computational work, again, more development, um, eye tracking, so you're learning more about the vision process, um, and the interpretative phenomenological analysis research group. <laughs>